Mighty and beautiful, Glücksburg Castle is the cradle of many royal dynasties in Europe. The Schlei, an arm of the Baltic Sea, has been shrouded in myth since the Vikings chose to settle here. They took to the sea from their legendary city, Haithabur. Deep coasts flank the underwater kingdom of the jellyfish, those delicate beauties with a stinging reputation. The route along Germany's Baltic coast leads us from Flensburg to Eckernförde. A bay to the north marks the border between Germany and Denmark. The ancient land of the Vikings is radiating with its deep blue fjords and the forested islands. The region came into being during the last ice age when shifting glaciers left deep channels in the earth. After the glacial melt had filled them with water, people decided to settle in the resulting well-protected bays. Flensburg is Germany's northernmost city. She is situated at the tip of an estuary that protrudes far inland, the Flensburg Fjord. The seaport has a very turbulent past. Both the Danish and the German fought over it. Sailors departed from here to West India on a quest for the fluid gold of the Caribbean, rum. Still today, merchant offices and warehouses shape the cityscape. 200 years ago, Flensburg was considered Europe's rum capital. Rum houses stood back to back in the narrow alleyways where the sugarcane schnapps were stored. Today, Flensburg's first and last address for rum lovers is Johansen's on Marine Street. Rum is still considered a bit dingy. It's a sailor's drink. The different rum blends have notes of cocoa, coffee and even pineapple. Everyone has to discover the fusion's different elements on their own. Rum is tasty. At least ours is. You know, there are so many different blends. There are light ones, there are heavy ones. The sailor's swill has become a sought after spirit. In its pure form, the high-proof distillate is unswallowable for European taste. The raw rum has to be blended with clean alcohol and water, reducing the alcoholic strength to make it quaffable. Ultimately, the secret of good rum lies in the right blend of distillates. And we add a bit of this and a bit of that to round it off. His great-grandfather founded the rum house 130 years ago. Today, Martin is the only rum dealer left in town. The raw rum still arrives from the Caribbean. It is stored for up to 12 years in large oak barrels. Whiskey and cognac have won the favor of connoisseurs while rum has largely fallen from grace. Und ab. But Martin Johansen isn't willing to surrender. He is sure that rum will experience a second spring. He stores his treasures for a long time to allow the rum's bouquet of cocoa, vanilla and fruit to develop. It's only then that the real Johansen will be bottled and sold. 
This method rounds off the rum additionally. It comes off with a milder taste, while it maintains its full flavor. While everybody knows rum, only few people buy and drink its original blend. Martin Johansen has lost his traditional customers. He is now desperately looking for successors, who are ready to replace the sailors. A brilliant beam is visible from afar in the fjord. The moated castle Glücksburg. The high walls and bulky towers are a reminder of the great powers once held by the Danish kings and German dukes that ruled these lands. Until today, the castle is the residence of the royal family of Schleswig-Holstein Sonderburg Glücksburg. Her Highness Elizabeth has a noble companion with another long pedigree at her side, a bulldog named Honey. Princess Elizabeth was born in the chateau. She has seen many blue-blooded aristocrats beating a path to her doorstep. Queen Margaret of Denmark visits regularly. She is as much of a dog lover as the princess. The Queen of Denmark is a cousin of the family. So, whenever a social event is coming up, like the wedding of a cousin or the birthday of an uncle, we are likely to see the Queen. They call this castle the cradle of the European royals. There is first and foremost Denmark, followed by Greece, England, Russia, Sweden and, of course, Spain. In the 16th century, the castle was built in a man-made lake. Thanks to King Christian of Denmark, it became the cradle of the European royals. Elizabeth's great-granduncle joined his numerous children in marriage with all the important aristocratic families. I don't believe that these were forcefully arranged marriages. They all met their prospective spouses beforehand. There were a lot of invitations to Copenhagen. There were many receptions and festivities, so yes, they all had time to get to know and love each other. Princess Elizabeth has two children. After the death of her husband, she returned to Glücksburg Castle. The moated castle holds 50 chambers. More than 80 servants were needed for its maintenance. That's why the princess is staying in a smaller house nearby, the Cavalier's Quarter. She opened her castle's doors to visitors and the historical rooms for wedding receptions. Every bedroom holds a fully functional ensuite bathroom. There are just so many chambers that need to be kept clean. And that's obviously quite a challenge if you're living in the castle with two or three people. Right behind the castle lies the peninsula Holness. One of the most striking landscape formations in the area is its cliff. The terminal moraines reaching all the way to the coast here are a product of the last ice age. The surf has formed the steep coast over the millennia. Arctic tern can be discovered in the nature reserve here.
many of the banks have transformed into a sea of flowers. We travel southeastwards along Angles coast. This region was home to a heathen people called the Angles, who set out to conquer Britain in 600 AD. Following the christening of the Northern Germanic tribes, churches were built all over Angol. An old chapel dating back to the 13th century clings to the bluff. The Baltic Sea's smooth waves and the endless beaches invite you to linger. The splendour of blossoming rose bushes adorns the gardens here. Humanity has been fascinated by roses for centuries, no millennia. No other plant is bred and grown as often as the rose. They can even blossom in the Arctic cycle in the Far East, Kamchatka, Japan. They are present everywhere. But their natural habitat is the Northern Hemisphere down to Northern Africa. The most renowned rose breeder in Northern Europe lives and works in a lonesome homestead. Ingvar Jensen started to breed roses half a century ago. He has created countless species. It's the combination of fragrance, color and shape that holds the magic for me. From the perspective of a breeder, it is also about the diversity which you can achieve. Every rose you create will differ from all others in one way or another. Roses are hermaphroditic. They are both male and female. Ingvar Jensen picks the petals off a selected plant to get to the male pollen. He divides the filaments with a couple of precise cuts and dries them in Petri dishes. Every cultivar will be pollinated onto the pistil of the ovary, which is the female part of another plant. This is done with a designated brush for the particular cultivar. It will take weeks before Jensen knows whether the hip was fertilized successfully. There's no doubt that you've got to be passionate about plants. Your first attempt is unlikely to succeed, so you need a lot of perseverance. You also need to be able to keep a secret. That's very important. Ingvar Jensen has established a rosarium on the palace grounds of Glücksburg Castle. The place oozes with the scent of English roses, as well as with that of his own colourful breeds. This rose is called Ina Emona. Just look at the glorious play of colours. We gave the bud a red hue, and the flower will have a rosy apricot shade. The blossom's color will change to a lighter hue with a dash of purple before it withers away. Ingvar Jensen's biggest difficulty lies in predicting the fragrance of a new rose. Though nature may never disclose this secret, Jensen is dead set on creating a unique fragrance. A combined scent of violets, lilies of the valley, passion fruit and banana. He spends months experimenting in his greenhouse, which offers stable temperatures all year round. The scent of a rose changes during the course of each day and the blossom's life on the whole. The flowers release certain oils as the temperature changes.
Whether it's a rose wilting or a person getting older, it is always fascinating how many new things one can still experience. Gelting Castle. Generations of manorial lords have formed the landscape here. The area used to be farmer's land, but when it didn't prove fertile enough, the fields were abandoned. Today, nature has begun to claim it back. Wild horses roam the area. They used to be spread out in all of Europe during the Stone Age. Their breed, the Kornix, has survived in Poland. These horses are known to be very frugal. They wander the nature reserve in three herds. Nils Korbach is the keeper of the horses. He has been the ranger in the nature reserve since 1999. He rarely visits the herds, as they ought to wander the reserve as undisturbed as possible. Nils Korbach brought the horses in to take care of the lead. The landscape is very special here. It captures you completely. Because the peninsula is right by the Baltic Sea, we have so many small, unique habitats here. We released the horses here because this used to be farmland. We don't want this area to become completely overgrown. We want to keep it open. With the horses grazing here, we will maintain an ecologically balanced habitat. We try to keep the horses as wild and independent as possible. We don't have stables for them. They need to look for their own shelter during storms and in the rain. Watching them graze to their heart's content gives Nils Korbach great pleasure. The insatiable cornix munch away on all undesirable plants such as cane, nettles and reeds. This gives rare plants the opportunity to resettle in the area. The horse keeper has left his dog in the car. Even though the Kornix don't face any natural enemies such as wolves and bears up here, Korbach is afraid of causing a panic amongst the horses. The wild horses seem anything but concerned. They do keep a distance though. Until their curiosity gets the better of them. Niels Korbach checks their general health. A vet is only called out here in severe situations. Niels looks out for parasites in their fur and checks their hooves for cracks. The animals have accepted him as a friend. I'm actually scared of horses. It's a really weird experience to be so close to them. I wasn't used to this. I used to work with dairy cattle and can't predict the horse's behavior. I mean, riding horses tend to become really frantic at times, but the conics are different. They are very laid back really, and that fascinates me. It's a true adventure maintaining a nature reserve. When he was young, Niels wanted to set out and become a marine biologist. 
However, the project with the wild horses held him here. The mellow cattle that were set up here are living in harmony with the horses. Thankfully, the nature reserve has become accessible for everyone today. The hiking trails are popular, even though many people were skeptical about the reserve in the beginning. There are still people arguing that it's no use and they don't care whether there are three species or 300 as long as their cars have 300 HP going. It takes a certain calm and the ability to open yourself up to understand the fascination nature holds, to take in all the diversity it has to offer. Many people can't see that. It's just a small distance to be covered from the peninsula of the wild horses to reach the steep cliffs of Kornsgard. On our way south, we pass infinite grain fields. The Baltic coast's landscape has always mesmerized artists. Many German expressionists have traveled to the Baltic Sea to draw their inspiration and enjoy the warm summer's breeze. Klaus Fussmann studied the so-called bridge movement, a group of German expressionist artists whose favorite subject was the sea. He now continues their work in his own art. There are countless paintings of the sea and the waves. The subject never ceases to amaze me. The sound of the breakers and the force of the sea, that's it. You always notice whether the painting was done in a studio or in nature. It's the tiny details that tell you, and definitely on a day like this. Well, it could do with a couple of clouds. That's nicer for the artist, but it's a beautiful day, rather dramatic and majestic, and that's what I like. Klaus Fußmann visits the steep cliffs almost daily in summer. He tries to capture the sea's different faces. But the artist never knows if he will succeed. Art is so poor compared to nature that it has to exaggerate. If you take a photo of the sea, it may seem like a beautiful picture, but you'll never get it right. Nature is still more powerful. It's never the same that it was in reality. You can't make it visible in a simple picture. Klaus Fußmann used to be a professor at the University of Fine Arts in Berlin. The 71-year-old only started painting the sea once he moved to the coast. Today his artworks are sold for at least 10,000 euros. The sea, the sky and the waves are discernible in his oil paintings. They have just been simplified into patches of colours. Nature is recomposed to fit the rectangular canvas. For Fussmann, the sea and the coast serve as a metaphor for nature's infinity. What lies behind the boundless horizon? He is trying to find answers through his artwork. In a way, every artist is also a magician. The magic he feels has to be recaptured in his artwork. If he's losing the magic moment, his art dies and turns into nothingness.
40 years ago, the Berlin-born Fussmann happened to stumble upon his dream house on the coast up here. And he discovered another subject for himself, flowers. Bobbing up and down in his garden sea breeze are hollyhocks, poppies and cut-leaved cone flowers. His hand leads the brush with confidence. The artist captures the flower's essence and dabs it tenderly on the canvas. There is no plan in my work. Suddenly, unexpectedly, a beautiful image just arises in front of your inner eye and screams, paint me now. That one thousandth of a second is an unbelievable feeling. We pass the mouth of a picturesque Baltic fjord. The Vikings were the first to discover the sheltered entrance into the arm of the sea. The lighthouse there can be seen from afar. Just behind it, an old fishing village leaps into view. The fjord reaches 40 kilometers inland. In front of the first bridge across the fjord, a peculiar array of stakes is to be found. It's the so-called herring fence, a wooden device used to catch the fish just like it was done in the Middle Ages. A couple of kilometers further down lies a true gem, Arnis, the smallest town in Germany. Arnis has only one street and a rattly car ferry that has pulled through the fjord with a steel rope. Arnis is something like a miniature version of a real town. We have town rights, but only 300 citizens. The city is so small that one can bottle her up easily. It's a small village, really. But we are very proud to live in a town. We are very aware of the status. I am happy and well here. Life is relatively easy and not really complicated, so I don't have too many worries. Especially in summer, that's the time of the year that I realize that we are living in paradise, really. Even today, the ornamented doors of the little houses are never locked. Everyone knows everyone in the miniature city. His great-grandfather was a captain and accumulated a fortune in the overseas trade. He donated the town hall in Arnis. Hans remained loyal to his family's maritime tradition. Together with his father and his brother, he operates marinas on the Baltic coast. One of them lies on Hans Jaich's doorstep. Everyone has to contribute. Hans collects harbour fees and keeps the bridge in good repair.
I used to believe that I ought to leave home, change the world and achieve something huge. That's what your ego feeds on. None of the people here care what you've done though. Whether you have a fat wallet or not is of no importance here. The sea is for free and that's the life. I have my peace of mind here. And that's why I feel at ease and honest. Hans spends a lot of time at sea with his girlfriend, Jolan. A marvel of engineering arises ahead. The old bascule bridge of Lindaunis, constructed in 1926. The bridge opens up hourly for 15 minutes. Once the sailing boats have passed through, the steel construction will shut again. The closed bridge carries cars and train wagons, in turn via a single lane. The bridge is the road connection between the two towns, Kappeln and Schleswig. The watercourse has not changed for thousands of years. Around 800 AD, Danish Vikings explored the far reaches of the waterway with their ships. With the hidden bays here, they discovered a brilliant base for their shipping trade and raids. The Vikings founded their settlement, Haitabu, at the Schleis end. The men from the north were dreaded throughout Europe. Rune stones mark their land, but Haitabu was an open trade city. It was profit to be made that unites the people here. Even Arabic tradesmen were living in Haitabu. The Forstead Ring Fort of Haitabu is still visible. It opens up to the water in a semicircle. In 1000 AD, this used to be the largest city of Scandinavia, featuring housing for up to 2,000 people. Warriors, merchants and craftsmen mingled here. Reinhard Erichsen stays in Haitabu during the summer months. As a paid modern Viking, he makes history come alive for the museum's visitors. If we had walked into the city 1,000 years ago, we'd have heard the hammering coming from the blacksmith's shops. We'd have heard the bubble of voices down by the harbor. Some may have walked to the docks to empty their dirt buckets. Others may have run down to welcome the arriving ships and check on the goods they have to offer. Reinhard Erichsen is not alone. His family has decided to travel back in time with him. Three generations are living underneath the thatched roof of the mud brick house. They spend their summers without electricity and running water. For me, it's the simplicity that makes it so interesting here. I start taking it for granted that I'll need to chop some wood before I can prepare breakfast. It's those simple actions that are necessary to get through the day, to fill your stomach and go about your work and duties. Traditionally, most people made a living as craftsmen. But those who became rich were in the trading business. They traded weapons and fine cloths from the south of Europe. 
Haitabu was also a notorious slave market. What fascinates me the most about the world of the Vikings is that ultimately they were humans just like you and me. Of course, there were the roughnecks who went on Vic raids to gather riches, but you also had the timid craftsmen. They preferred to stay in Haitabu and manufacture combs rather than looking for adventures at sea. Reinhard Erichsen is something like a professional Viking. The learned carpenter is a champion of Viking archery. He handles the longbow with grace and strength. The weapon holds a penetrating power which is devastating. This arrowhead was forged by the hand of a Viking blacksmith. It's shaped like a needle in order to penetrate chain mails and armor. Grandson Torre and daughter Anna, together with little Ronja, are learning a lot. During their time travel, they have come to realize how the Vikings lived a thousand years ago. With gods such as Odin and Thor, but also with demons and wizards. On the other side of Haitabu's Bay lies a formerly magic place. A rune stone was discovered here 200 years ago. Runes are the Teuton's oldest lettering system. Did the Vikings also believe in their magical power? This particular runestone was placed here by Queen Astrid in the year 900. It honors her son who died in battle. Runes are letters carved in stone. Many of the signs resemble the Latin script. It's significant that this memorial was put up here by a woman. It's an indication of the equality women enjoyed during the Viking era. And the woman is the boss in the house. She holds the keys to the pantry. And not even her own husband would have gone there without asking her permission first. But luck is not in Haitabu's side. Slavs plunder the city, and the citizens are forced to leave in 1066. Haitabu sinks into oblivion. A new center of power began to develop on the opposite shore, Schleswig. Today, it is still a flourishing city, with many historical quarters. Gotthoff Castle. It was ruled by the German dukes of Schleswig-Holstein. Some of them reigned as Danish kings at the same time. Gotthoff used to be a small sovereign state, attracting artists and academics from all over Europe. The Dukes of Gotthoff built a magnificent French palace garden. We travel across on the Baltic Sea's fjord Schlei to Eckernförde, one of the bustling cities that are so typical of the life here in northern Germany. The sea of red-tiled roofs houses 23,000 people. And in summer, the beaches around the bay attract just as many tourists. The pleasure of swimming here is often spoiled by a tiny creature that is much hated by the tourists. In springtime, it's only a few of them, but starting in August, they gather for attack. Jellyfish. 
They have been living in the Earth's water for eons. They have been around for much longer than humans. The red lion's main jellyfish is feared for its dangerous tentacles. Each summer they invade the Baltic. They arrive here in large numbers and frighten the visitors. But there are also people who quite like the slimy monsters. Some are revolted by them. And for others, they're captivating beauties. They look so delicate with their slow movements. Once you dive down there, it feels as though someone has turned back time. Everything is calmer. They just seem to exude this feeling of tranquility. Sandra Pipioca cannot get enough of jellyfish. The red lion's main jellyfish use the cyanidocyte in their tentacles to capture their prey. It numbs and immobilizes small fish so that they can slowly be digested. Sandra wears a wetsuit when diving. Despite this, the cyanidocyte can sometimes still sting through the suit's fine pores. Once they have stung you, it feels as if someone takes a small razor blade to your skin. It's really a vicious, stinging pain. But it subsides again after two or three hours, that's the good thing about it. But if you were to be stung on your entire body, then you may go into a state of shock. Eckernförde Harbour this is Sandra's favourite hunting ground whenever she's on the prowl for her medusas. Tens of thousands of jellyfish collect in the port basins. The harmless common jellyfish accounts for most of them. Sandra knows that jellyfish have long since become a plague. Not only holidaymakers are affected. The fishermen's nets around here fill up with jellyfish too and easily break with their heavy load. Despite this, Zandra has always maintained her love for the gently floating sea dwellers. She studies the reproduction system and eating habits of jellyfish. Zandra works as an ocean ranger. Jellyfish could be the winners of the world's changing climate. Plankton, the favourite dish of all jellyfish, is blossoming as oceans are becoming warmer. The amount of plankton increases at an even faster rate in the Baltic Sea due to over-fertilisation. Holiday makers are annoyed by the slimy pests that spoil their fun at the beach. But Zandra thinks that they're not as bad as their reputation. They are a bit like an environmental police. They are the garbage chute of the sea. In areas where there are too many nutrients spoiling the water, they take care of them. And this prevents the Baltic Sea from collapsing. Delicate and beautiful, that's what they are. And now they are writing another chapter in the Book of Evolution. They are preparing to rule the ocean's ecological system. The comb jelly made its appearance in the Baltic Sea three years ago. It is almost see-through and the tiny tentacles glow in the dark. The comb jelly is an alien. It originates from the Caspian Sea. It seems to have been carried off to the Baltic in the ballast waters of the cargo ships and tankers. Just like the common jellyfish, it has an insatiable appetite. Together, they are too much to handle for the Baltic Sea. They simply aren't freezing to death in winter. That's why they are back every single year. They spawn every fortnight, which means that the sea is full of these gorgeous, evil comb jellies. They are also called the Caspian monster. 
Instead of watching Nemo in the cinema, one can pet jellyfish in the viewing basin here. Whenever Zandra isn't catching jellyfish, she tells children all about the slimy creatures. Her little visitors learn about male and female jellyfish and how they have a love life too, just like humans. Sandra is keen to pass on her knowledge to the kids. If only one of them shares her fascination for the jellyfish, she is happy. This is what I was born to do. I couldn't live without the sea. It's the essence of my life. The beauty of the Baltic Sea and its intensity sadly cannot be put up in tanks. Das kann man auch nicht ins Aquarium holen. Mermaids and seahorses are just a few of the surprises that can be encountered in the Bay of Eckernförde. Eckernförde is also home to Germany's submarine squadron. The past and the future meet at this pier. An old diesel-powered submarine lies next to a new one, powered by hydrogen. It can stay underwater for up to six weeks. It's early morning. Roll call for the crew of U-32. U-32 is one of the most modern submarines in the world. It is powered by hydrogen technology. U-32 has got another special feature too. A female crew member, Petty Officer Caroline Peters. It's undeniably quite a shock to come aboard for the first time. You've got to have a thick skin to be able to do this and probably be a bit crack brain too. Caroline Peters is stationed on the upper deck during cast off. Her job is to dismount all the superstructures before the submersion. The submarine is manned by a crew of only 28. This means that everyone aboard has to perform several tasks. The turns are four hours each. It's four hours of work, four hours of sleep. I work on the upper dock during cast off. I've got the torpedoes and I also work with the console. I love to work as a lookout, standing up there on the bridge and checking where we are heading. At last, U-32 has got enough water beneath the hulk. The commander gives the final orders for submersion. Everyone in the main office is highly focused during the descent into the deep. The commander and the mates are in position, working on the consoles. The hydrogen fuel cells and, if need be, the four torpedoes are operated from here. Caroline has got another job here. She listens to the Baltic Sea's underwater world and searches for the sounds of obstacles and other ships which may be crossing their path. As a sonar officer, she is the ear of the submarine. A single woman amongst 27 men. 
crammed together in the tiniest of spaces. She even shares a bed with a male comrade. There is no such thing as privacy in the submarine. But Caroline Peters has managed to hold her own in this male microcosm. I grew up on the shore. I joined the Navy because I want to see the world, to get out there and even make some money on the side doing it. Everyone has watched movies about submarines, like Das Boot. And then I thought, well, let me just give it a bash. Caroline Peters has made her dream come true. U-32 is taking course to the Mediterranean. It will be four months before the submarine will reach its native shores again, here on the Baltic coast.